Are there any objective biomarkers? You know, everyone's wearing wearables these days and you can see your sleep score, you can see your resting heart rate or HRV. Do Are these helpful at all for considering whether you have the right dose of the stress in place and or the right recovery in place? Yeah, I I find that heart rate variability is one of the more helpful of the measurements. Um, If you have created a stress that's too intense, let's say overtrained, too hard a workout, um, heart rate recovery would be a way to know that you've probably pushed yourself too much with a stressor and you need more time for recovery. Um, I find that um, to be one of uh, the more helpful measures. And then there are a lot of biomarkers to help you know if your intervention over time is helping you get healthier. So what are relevant metrics, for example, um, you know, presumably they're the goal of doing this, again, is not stress for the sake of stressing yourself out. It's stress for the sake of becoming more disease resilient uh, for slowing your biological age. Um, So there are certainly lab biomarkers, um, and we can go through ones that I think are very relevant. There are also some aging biomarkers, um, you know, that we've used in our clinical studies. And um, certainly they are also in evolution, but I think some can be very useful and practical. Um, And that is one way to know if what you are doing over some course of time, which I'll term an intervention using these good stressors, but I almost hesitate to use that term because I think of good stressors as a way we're meant to live, um, as opposed to thinking about them as the intervention. I actually think our Western lifestyle is the intervention. And this is a big human experiment that isn't going well. Um, and that these stressors are are more the normative lifestyle that we were meant to live. But nonetheless, we can um, measure the pre and post and, um, and see if we're achieving our goals. Yeah, let's step through some of those so people have an idea of a few things they can keep an eye on as they're integrating some of these good stresses in their life. So if we start with lab biomarkers, what are what are some of the results on their regular blood panel that they might keep an eye on and use as an indicator that these good stresses that they're adding adding to their life are effective and are are beneficial for them? I'll start with some very basic labs that are so accessible and simple that you can get through a regular doctor's visit. Yeah, and they're so informative. Um, I think hemoglobin A1C, which is a three month average of blood sugar, is very um, important, critically important. And I would put fasting blood sugar in that bucket. And one that is inexpensive, but not always tested, is an insulin level. And I would utilize those three to get a sense of not only your blood sugar, but also um, a sense of your insulin resistance level. And to me, the reason I think they're all important is, first of all, metabolic health plays such a critical role in our overall health. Um, It is really the pathway and the process that increases our risk of cardiometabolic disease, cancer risk, neurodegenerative disease. So I think getting our metabolic health in order is such a critical piece. And the reason I like to incorporate a fasting insulin along with fasting blood sugar is because when you use um, a validated equation such as a HOMA IR, a homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance, you can gauge insulin resistance, which can happen about a decade or two before blood sugar becomes abnormal. When there's first insulin resistance, the pancreas compensates by making more insulin that can mask an abnormal blood sugar. So the term prediabetes um, is a bit of a misconception because it's a process that has been ongoing um, for quite some time until it manifests. Um, So these earlier ways of detecting that this metabolic Um, disease is happening, I think are really helpful. Um, I think a lipid panel 
um, basic total cholesterol, uh, HDL, LDL triglycerides is extremely helpful as well. Um, and blood pressure is such a simple tool. And waist circumference, just so simple, right? You can get a tape measure, um, you know, just simply measuring to see if your waist circumference is greater than 40 inches as a um, man, as 35 inches as a woman. I mean, these are the criteria for metabolic syndrome that we're really talking about. And they're so critical because we know that 93% of people in America do not have good metabolic health. And this is um, just such a critical piece of our overall health and our aging biology that I, I think that these are just such basic labs and they give us so much information that that's a good starting point. And these good stressors are incredibly effective at reversing as well as preventing and slowing the progression of metabolic disease. Okay, I have a bunch of questions and comments from that. So firstly, I think it's I think it's great that you pointed out the benefit of ordering fasting insulin. Because as you say, the the pancreas can just compensate and produce more insulin. And so your blood glucose, blood sugar can look normal for a while, even though your body is just essentially your pancreas is putting the foot on the accelerator. And it's only a matter of time until it begins to wear out. And with that, you're going to see increases in, in blood sugar. So I think that's really important to point out because often people just get the blood glucose measurements and think that they're okay and there's nothing to act on. So um, that's really useful. My question to you would be of the good stresses, given how important metabolic health is, which ones do you think are most impactful at when it comes to improving metabolic health? If I had to pick one, um, I would put exercise as the one. Um, I think exercise can just send such a strong stimulus um, in a very quick amount of time um, that are that creates this metabolic stress that our bodies adapt in a way that helps overcome insulin resistance very rapidly. So um, I would put that as first, and then a close second would be the timing of our meals and our circadian biology, so fasting, I think. Um, and I think next I would put in terms of magnitude, um, the phytochemical response that we have um, to stressed plants and um, heat and cold therapy would um, certainly, I would not put as first line. I think they're adjuncts to the exercise and uh, dietary piece. Okay, so that was the, the lab biomarkers that people can keep an eye on and particularly the cardiometabolic ones. You mentioned blood pressure as well, waist circumference. What about the aging biomarkers that you mentioned. I think you said you've done some some research here. Do we have, um, I guess, clinical evidence or any evidence that these good stresses and the subsequent activation of the these biological pathways really slows aging at a cellular level? And is that something we can keep an eye on? So I will talk a little bit about the biomarkers and where we can go with them. And um, I can also mention a study we did um, that looked at a hormetic association between stress and biological age. Um, the current state of these biological markers of aging is um, in evolution, and I think they're getting better. Um, biological age is essentially determining a person's um, age that can be different from chronologic age based on methylation of the our human genome through our lifelong exposures. And through a vial of blood, we can measure about 950,000 foci on the human genome. Um, we can take that data, um, use machine learning algorithms that have been trained on different models to get an estimate of biological age. 
the older models, uh, the Horvath and Hannum models, were trained on chronologic age. And um, second generation clocks like Pheno Age, Grim Age, include some phenotypic markers. Um, hence, you know, things like um, whether a person smokes, etc. Um, they are, you know, have been improved upon. But the limitation with these biological aging markers is really epigenetic changes happen over a course of a lifetime. And they're not very sensitive to short um, interventions of change. So um, more sensitive to uh, intervention that you do over a shorter time frame, which would be things like these good stressors, would be utilizing a tool such as the Dunedin pace clock, which is looking at your rate of aging. Um, so I think that that may become a better metric than um, some of the biological aging or epigenetic clocks. And the other part to that is that the um, ICC or the intraclass correlation coefficient, um, that's essentially if you're doing the same biological age test, how reliable is it? Are you going to get the same response when you repeat that test over and over? And with the biological age markers, um, there's, it's not as tight, the ICC is not as tight, so you get a broader range of responses, whereas with the Dunedin pace, you have um, better reliability with the ICC. And so I think um, as a marker that that holds more potential. The, um, what do we know so far? So we, for example, looked at psychological stress and um, its correlation with biological age. So already there's a shortcoming here in that we're, we're not showing causality. Um, we are essentially just looking for an association. So I, I can't say that, you know, we have shown that we are necessarily slowing or accelerating aging. There's a limitation in the methodology in being able to say that. But what I can say is that we um, designed a study where we were looking at perceived stress and resilience um, through some validated questionnaires. We also looked at um, some markers such as cortisol, the ratio of DHEA to cortisol and DHEA levels. And we went into the study with a hypothesis that if a person has higher stress, their rate of aging, or I should say their biological age, um, was going to be accelerated. And if a person had low stress, they would have deceleration in their biological age. And what was really fascinating is amongst people who had low resilience, we saw a hormetic association where people who had a moderate level of stress that was about the same as normative levels in the United States had a lower biological age than people who had low levels of stress. So again, this hormetic relationship. So it's an association study. I think we, um, you know, in, are indirectly finding that there's probably some, um, <laughs> you know, some relationship, but um, certainly, I, I, you know, there's no causality from that. Biological age was higher in the people who had a low amount of stress or a high amount of stress compared to those who had moderate Yes, and, and predominantly what, yes, um, and more fascinating exactly was this moderate range because that's what was the part that was not anticipated. I am absolutely excited to share an exclusive offer with the Proof community. This is a limited time offer just for my audience and no doctor referral is needed. Function Health is a comprehensive at-home blood testing service that gives you access to over 100 biomarkers, covering everything from heart, liver, kidney, and metabolic health to hormone levels, inflammation, and nutrient status. That, my friends, is five times more testing than the average physical. I chose Function for my own blood work and to be a sponsor of this show because they are the best in the world when it comes to helping you understand and own your health. It's true, the depth and quality of their testing is unrivaled. And as regular listeners of this show will know, you cannot optimize what you don't measure. Don't guess. 
test. Use function to know exactly where your health is today and then intervene with evidence-based medicine and lifestyle changes to feel your best and reduce your risk of chronic disease. With function, you get access to very important markers like LP little a, a genetically driven cardiovascular risk factor, APOB, the most predictive marker of atherosclerosis, and LH and FSH, reproductive hormones typically missing from standard lab panels. It's not uncommon for these biomarkers and others to be elevated. For example, over 50% of function members have an APOB level, and over 20% have an LPA little level that is above the optimal range. You can even add on harder to access tests like cystatin C, a very sensitive marker of kidney function, as well as selenium and iodine nutrients that are essential for thyroid and overall health, yet rarely tested. So what are you waiting for? Run over to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill today and be one of 1000 listeners to score a $100 credit. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.